we will get into our study of, of Jude. That was an excellent summary. Reminds you of John chapter 5, verses 39 and 40. This frames the whole discussion we've been having on this for over a year now where Jesus chided the religious leaders, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it's they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. And, of course, the discussion in Jude is not very far from that. People who would claim to know him and yet in, by lifestyle deny him. As you saw in the video, Jude makes it obvious as he opens his letter that he had, a, he had a, another purpose in mind. I was very eager to write to you about this common salvation. He wanted it to be a treatise uh, on the gospel, very much like the gospel of John. But word has come to him about his readers that they are being led astray uh, in terms of lifestyle matters, of what is, what is true, what is false, what is good, what is evil. And if we talked to you in, in recent times particularly about uh, the creeping Gnostic heresy. And one of the forms of Gnosticism was that, that because uh, human nature is fallen and the body is, is corrupt and decaying, Paul talks about this tabernacle we have wasting away, that, that the main thing was that your spirit was saved. And it didn't really matter so much what you did in your body because the body was corrupt anyway. And this is a mentality that dealt uh, some serious blows to the early church, but it, we know it's, a, it's wrong doctrine leads to wrong living. It's just that we're not told what the, what the doctrine was. We have a suspicion it was something like that. And then he gives these examples of how God deals with licentious living. It's amazing to me through the years. I mean, when you've, when you've visited people and talked with people for over 40 years about these matters, how many people can look you straight in the eye, be in obvious, uh, gross immorality, the Scripture would call it, and feel no compunction about it, uh, believe somewhere in there, in their conscience, uh, that they are saved, that they're going to be with the Lord when they die. Uh, it is just, it's uh, shocking. It should be a warning to us about how clever the enemy of our souls is to, uh, to duplicate, to masquerade, to falsify real Christianity and, and present it as the real thing, even though it's false. And so Jude has to address this, and he challenges them to build themselves up in the most holy faith. If we outline Jude, we come up with something like this, and here's, there's going to be some unknowns here. We don't know where it was written from. Uh, we're not even sure who the recipients were. The video takes the, a stab at, at what he calls Messianic Jews or, or people of a Jewish background who've come to be followers of Christ. The date of writing is on a sliding scale, depending on whether you think We'll get into this a little later, whether you think Second Peter was written first or Jude was written first. Clearly, when you read the two side by side, there's some borrowing one from another going on. Uh, we'll look at that a little later. Uh, so you have this purpose spelled out. Uh, he wants them to contend for the faith, earnestly engage, not passively sit back and let, let whatever happens, happens. Uh, and so he begins to kind of spell out, one writer said, an anatomy of apostasy, just how it happens. Second thing is a description of false teachers, where he goes in verses 5 to 16, talks about their, the, the past judgment that was predicted of them, the, the present characteristics that mark them, the future judgment that's coming to them. And then he spends the last, some of the last uh, verses, 17 and 23, showing them how to defend against false, teach, false teachers. And so the same writer I was looking at said this would be a, if he challenges them to contend and warns them about apostasy, this is how to contend and becomes an antidote for apostasy. He lays down the duty of believers in this section. 
And then finally, this doxology, which is, which is one, of the, one of the most marvelous ones in all of Scripture, uh, this great declaration. So that there's not a, you know, when you study these kind of things, what I've found through the years is that the tender conscience believer, the person who is truly saved and yet just struggles to, struggles to know it, struggles to have a measure of security in it, that typically when you go through this, they'll be the ones who are convinced they're not saved. Years ago, I was in another place, and I would preach some of these issues. And, and the, the, you know, <laughs> the one person you were, you were confident did know the Lord would be the one that would come and say, oh, pray for me. I'm just, my heart is so wicked. I, I, you know, so I know I've got to be careful about this when we study this. Uh, we ought to examine ourselves, whether we be in the faith, but don't let that move to what's called morbid introspection. Take what is said here uh, in context make the application, but not let the enemy of our souls convince you you don't know the Lord simply because you may not be always walking in the vitality you want to have in him. If you summarize this in a more extended way, the paragraph summary we've looked at, um, one writer said, he said, it's surprising when you, when you lay down the letters in the New Testament, Paul's writings, the writings of others who are not Paul, how many times in these letters they confront the problem of false teachers, uh, and then those that don't confront them will make an allusion to it. The point being, it was a serious issue. As, as Jesus Christ ascends and churches are planted, and then these apostles begin to move off the scene, all manner of, of error was sweeping over. I've told you this before about what I observed in China uh, a couple of decades ago now. It really stunned me. You, know, you hear about the underground church growing and the, this amazing uh, rapid growth of the underground church, but along with that, are cultic phenomena that hijack a lot of these underground churches uh, for a lack of doctrinal, uh, a solid doctrinal foundation. And then he closes uh, with uh, the doxology, as I said. So, so you get into the, to the letter itself, and one writer said, Jude goes beyond all other New Testament letters in its relentless and passionate denunciation of the apostate teachers who have, quote, crept in unnoticed. They have uh, used deceit. Oh, yeah, we, I believe, I, we believe that. I believe that like you believe. Um, the whole letter revolves around this, except for verses 1 to 2, which is the salutation, and verses 24 and 25, which is the closing doxology. He addresses the problem. I found this I thought was interesting about another writer. Combining the theme of 2 Peter with the style of James, Jude is potent in spite of its brevity. So you have, as we looked earlier, the, the purpose of Jude. He addresses those uh, who've been kept, called, and he asks, he says, I'm praying for a threefold blessing upon you. Mercy peace and love, the mercy of God, his, his love for those who are uh, unfortunate, his love for those who are to be, it's a, it's a love of pity, a love of pitying the weak, the frail. He wants the mercy of God to abound. Uh, receive mercy, Jesus taught, you're more inclined to show mercy. So there's not in, not in this letter a uh, tone of of hostility to, to be, to be uh, cruel to the false teachers, simply to deal with them, to recognize them and deal with them. Peace. The word peace, remember, is the word for, for uh, a reconciliation. If, if we meet one another in the, in the streets of the New Testament era and one of us says, Irene, which is the word peace in Greek, the other should respond, Irene. If that doesn't come back, there's something, something wrong here. And that's how they would... What's, we've got to close that gap. We've got to, we've got to work at this. We've got to reconcile. It was the greeting. Uh, having peace with God, we're to have peace with one another. And then love, of course, we've been making a much of that in 1 Corinthians 13 in recent days. And so Jude sets aside his preference and writes to warn them of this encroaching uh, licentiousness. Licentiousness is loose living. You have the description in verses 5 to 16. Uh, and he talks about how, uh, how God has always judged the unbelieving. 
Uh, he illustrates three examples from the, from the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses. He says in verse 5, those, those from whom the chosen people who refused to believe, the, the Israelites, the chosen people of God, brought out and rescued, did not, uh, they did not obey, and they perished along the way. The fallen angels the, that were kicked out of heaven uh, in the uprising, and then the immoral Gentiles uh, that are described in Genesis 18 and 19. So he draws upon these Old Testament images that they would, these Jewish Christians would be familiar with. He, he refers to these false teachers as people who are uh, unreasonable, that you can't reason with them. Uh, the very things they revile, they themselves seem to be practicing. And then as I said as we were reading through it, it's, it's fascinated me for some time studying through this material how, how you have all of these or many of these people on TV and tent crusades and, and uh, arena crusades that, that make so much of, um, I'm binding the devil, I bind you, devil, I don't allow you, devil, I... You just don't see that in the scriptures. You see just the exact opposite commended. That Michael, the archangel, when contending for the body of Moses, did not take on the enemy of our souls directly as, as the archangel, taking on a fallen angel, uh, one who was the archangel. Rather says, the Lord rebuke you. He made it very plain who had the authority to do that, who had the power to do that. He did not take it into himself. It's a good, good lesson for us. We ought to perk our ears up when we hear these people taking authority in an area where the archangel himself did not do that. And as you heard in the video, he focuses on the heresy of the teachers, or the, he focuses more on the teachers and their lifestyle rather than their doctrinal heresies. Uh, so one writer said, this, we can take this to mean that he assumes that they were familiar with the details of their teaching, of what led to it. And of course, he summons up these three uh, Old Testament figures as you, as you were taught uh, in the video. In verses 17 to 23, uh, when he teaches them how to make defense against the false teachers, um, he turns the tone in verse 17, but you, beloved, you, you must remember, beloved. They may be doing this, and they're doing this, and they're this, and they're that, but you must remember. And so he exhorts them. That what they're dealing with is not something new. The, uh, the apostles warned of this. Jesus warned of this in, his, in the gospel writings. What would come to them. And so it's important for them to mature in their own faith. To, you know, the, you, you read this and you think, at least I think of Ephesians 6, to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the fiery darts of the evil one and having done all that you will stand. Feet firmly planted. Not give in to, not, not by... Uh, the lure, James talked about that, this lure that's worked in front of us. Let no one say when he's tempted, he's tempted by God. But each man is tempted when he's enticed, he takes the bait, and then there's a, there's a, a germination of uh, sin that begins to grow, and when it becomes full grown, it leads to death and destruction. Believers are to respond with mercy, the very mercy he commended to them. Not belligerence when contending for the faith. You don't, you don't, Paul said in, in uh, Corinthians, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We don't, we don't fight like the world fights. But he says they are mighty and they, and they result in tearing down strongholds. We've looked at that before and studied that. Hate the heresy. Have compassion on those who were victimized by the heresy, influenced by the lifestyle, and, and resist and insist that those uh, practicing it, fomenting it, uh, be stopped. And then this doxology we'll look at at the end, just this marvelous, what he asserts about God in this. It's so encouraging uh, to people who may be struggling 
with the reality of their own sin. Well, who's the author? Uh, the good news is that when you look at the history of, of, of developing the Bible, the Scripture, uh, that Jude, even though it was very small, was accepted as authentic uh, from a wide range of folks um, and was quoted by the church fathers. That's, we've, you should know by now as we've gone through this study that when you find the early church fathers, remember now, you have Jesus Christ, you have his, his apostles, and the apostles themselves, they did what they were commanded. They, they instructed others as well who were able to teach others. And so you have the disciples of the apostles who were what's called the church fathers, the early church fathers. And when you see them quoting from biblical, what we know to be biblical passages, you, that's, a, that's a message that we recognize this as inspired and authentic. And Jude is in that category. Uh, and they appear without dispute in the last quarter of the second century. Accepted as part of scripture uh, and some of the, some of the writers, this, I don't know, this won't mean a whole lot to you, but Tertullian and Origen were two of the early church fathers that, that put a stamp of approval on this being scripture. Part of the challenge to the canonicity though, we'll get into this a little, a little more, is uh, that Jude quoted from uh, Apoc the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha. Apocrypha being, being that collection of works we looked at when we were studying between the Testaments. Uh, the Pseudepigrapha is the writings, pseudo meaning false, false writings, and, and he cites them. We'll, we'll kind of deal into why he does that a little later. So, it, but it caused some dispute about the book having these quotations. He identifies himself as a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, of James and. Uh, So he's not uh, Jude, Judas, the son of James, that you find in Luke's gospel or in early book of Acts. Um, the traditional view is that this Jude was one of the Lord's brothers called Judas, or, or Judah, as you heard in the, uh, in the video. Just look at a couple of verses here in the New Testament with me. Matthew 13, 55, where the, where the religious leaders are questioning Jesus, who he is, and what, what authority he might have and where it would come from. Is not this the carpenter's son? That's a slap at him, by the way, as a rabbi, as a teaching rabbi. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And that's the, that's the figure we think we're dealing with here in this, this person called Jude. Mark 6, 3, same, same passage, parallel passage. And you see uh, his name there uh, with the addition and are not his sisters here with us. Uh, so they were offended by Jesus because he didn't have the scholarship background that they had. Uh, look at John 7, 1 to 9. It says, after this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now, the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. So his brothers said to him, leave here and go to Judea that your disciples also may see the works you're doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Verse 5, critical. For not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about, what it, about it, that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I'm not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. And so he remained in Galilee. He makes a distinction with them. The world cannot hate you. Why? Why would the world not hate them? Because they're not identified with him. They don't believe. They would come to believe. Look at Acts 1.14. All these with one accord, were, one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. And so there came, there came a time, the, the gory death, uh, the burial, the resurrection, the empty tomb, where these brothers faced the fact that this brother of theirs was not crazy, as they had as asserted earlier in the Gospels when they came to rescue him from himself, but he was indeed the Son of God, the Messiah. Acts 15, 22 may be another reference to this, to this individual. 
This is in the Jerusalem Council setting uh, where, uh, where James is one of the leading figures. Uh, then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas called Barsabbas. This is, we think maybe another name for this Jude fellow. And Silas leading men among the brothers. And Judas and Silas who were themselves prophets encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. So it, it could be a, this could be a reference to the same to the author here. Uh, we don't get any help really extra biblically. All this is internal evidence. The date and setting of Jude uh, is, is tricky. Uh, there's no particular circle of readers identified by his letter. No geographical restrictions, nothing said in the letter that would, would help us to pinpoint who the readers were, who the recipients were. We know this, and you heard this in the video. It was a region being troubled by these false teachers who were, who were teaching loose living in the name of grace. But Jude is definitely taking up this progress of their faith in the region was threatened by a number of apostates who rejected uh, Christ in practice and in principle. Uh, what, another word for these folks is libertines. <clears throat> As we've thought together through the years, we've tried to let you get a picture that there are two ditches we always want to avoid because they, they lead to the same place ultimately. One is legalism. This was the Pharisees issue. It's an issue today with capital F, fundamentalism. <clears throat> the other was, was licentiousness or a libertine attitude. One makes more of the law than you should. One makes less of the law than you should. Guess what they both do? They both provoke an antino antinomian lifestyle, a life lived as if there was no law. This is the group Jesus rejects in Matthew 7 when he says, Depart from me. You, Anomia, you practice lawlessness. I've, I've never known. I've never had a relationship with you. And so these folks were in the libertine ditch, and they were uh, <clears throat> dangerous because of, of deceptive flattery, verse 16 tells us. Uh, they'd infiltrated their Christian meetings. You get a picture, you know, oh, i just tell you, I just love being free in Christ. I've never been so free in my life. I, you know, that kind of language. Well, amen, thank God for the freedom that's in Christ. But it ought to be freedom to serve him, freedom to, to pursue holiness, freedom to share the gospel, not freedom to indulge in a sinful lifestyle. So they were perverting the grace of God. And their lifestyle, which was part of their teaching, was causing divisions in the church. When you read through his, uh, his description of these heretics, it may remind you, and I would just encourage you when you have an opportunity to read through 2 Peter, and you're going to hear some of the same language. It's particularly 2 Peter 2, chapter 1, verse 3, uh, ver 2, chapter 1 through chapter 3, verse 4. Uh, and as one writer said, these verses 4 to 18 can hardly be coincidental, as if they're oblivious of one another. Just what we don't know is who copied whom, who, who was influenced by whom. It's not wrong to do that, by the way. I've told you before, if you, if you could read Greek <clears throat> and did a synopsis of the Gospels and laid Matthew, Mark, and Luke in, in three columns, you would be stunned at some of the sections where, I mean, for whole sections, sentences, paragraphs, they, they quote identically. They say identically the same thing. It's not, it's not wrong. Uh, they were telling eyewitness accounts, and they were, they were drawing upon the reliable sources to do that. There's two arguments. I won't get into all, get you bogged you down with all the reasons why this one thinks it, but there's two arguments for the priority of 2 Peter. In other words, Peter writing first. One is... The comp a comparison of the two books shows that Second Peter anticipates the future rise of apostate teachers. Let's just look. I don't think I have that on the slide. Let's look at that real quickly. Uh, Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 says this. The false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. In chapter 3, 
uh, verse 3, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. Peter uses this word master. You'll, re you'll remember when we study Second Peter, uh, it's, the, it's the word despotes. It's not the word kurios, which we typically think of as, as our master, our Lord. It's, it's despotes. He's the owner. He's the creator owner. That's, that's how a creature made in the image of God may profess to know him, to know the Lord, but not really know him, and he's denying his master, his despotes, his creator, really, is the language there. So the first one is the, uh, the comparison. While Jude records the historical fulfillment of Peter's words in his letter. Then secondly, Jude directly quotes 2 Peter 3.3 3 and acknowledges it as a quote from the apostles. We'll look at that. We cannot know when this was written. And if 2 Peter was indeed written first, uh, then you would put a date range of 66 A.D. to 80 A.D. That, uh, that takes you, remember, 70 A.D. is the pivotal point. That's the destruction of the temple. We typically have dated books going through this study as to whether or not they reference that event. Uh, in Jude's case, uh, his absence of saying anything about that does not mean it hadn't already happened. So 66 to 80 A.D. would be the best sliding scale that you would to identify when Jude was written. What was the theme and purpose of Jude? Uh, he certainly is intensely concerned about the threat of these heretical teachers, what they, what they pose to this congregation, how they can undo it. Uh, I don't know if, how much study you've done through the years and how much you remember the, uh, the Children of God movement in the, that came out of the, of the Jesus Revolution in the hippie era. Uh, David, David uh, Moses uh, became called David, David Moberg, uh, was their prophet. And he, he gathered quite a following of young uh, people who had <clears throat> some sort of encounter in the Jesus Revolution, some sort of encounter with Jesus. And it was a... Uh, it's a quite licentious movement. And there's been a documentary done that I saw just a little bit of. Uh, it's pretty telling. If you get a hold of that, uh, the, Ch the Children of God was the name of the cult. And uh, kind of give you an idea of what was going on in the first century uh, that gave Jude cause for concern. There's r two real major purposes that he wrote this. First is to condemn the practices of the ungodly libertines who were infesting the churches and corrupting believers, all right? That's one of them. And secondly, to counsel the readers to stand firm and grow in their faith and contend for the truth. Anyone who would receive the letter it was probably read in church. I'm sure some people were not happy to hear it, but those who would receive it as from Jude would be, would be inclined and encouraged to plant their feet. Those who maybe were dismayed and wondered what to do, Jude would strengthen them in this letter that he wrote. But the keys... Uh, to Jude. Well, the key phrase we, we suggest is contend for the faith. And that's, if, if you use that phrase, that's most commonly identified with this letter of Jude. Key verse we read is verse 3, beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary. I wanted to do this, but necessity put this constraint upon me to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Doesn't change. We talk about that on Reformation Day. If the truth, if it was true then, it's true now. If it's not true now, then why would we assert it was true then? Truth is not evolutionary. Uh, no matter what open theists suggest, no matter what pro so-called progressive Christians suggest, truth is not evolutionary. Truth has a finality about it. And our responsibility is to pass that on, not to take the faith once for all delivered to the saints has been delivered to us and say, well, I think it needs to be tweaked. No. That same faith communicated to the generations following us. Uh, so what do you, where do you see Jesus in Jude? Well, uh, there's certain verses that, that uh, reference him. Look at Jude uh, verse 4. Certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people... Um, 
typically, by the way, we've told you this, it's not always the case, but when, you, when the term ungodly and unrighteous, when those terms are used, uh, they can often be shorthand uh, for un, ungodly being the first table of the law, uh, living in a way that is, that is rejecting God's calls about his name, his person, uh, his day. Uh, here, though, it's, a, it's more expanding. It's the, the implication here is they're ungodly people. They live in an ungodly way. They're rejecting God the authority of God. Listen to this. Who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master. There's that word again that comes up in Peter, our despotes, deny our only creator and Lord, kurios. Both of those terms used nuanced a little differently are used together to strengthen the argument. Jesus, the architect, made us and saved us. And these people, by their lifestyle, say we reject the Creator in whose image we're made. We reject the Savior. Oh, we're going to claim that He saved us, but we reject the teachings of the Savior, Jesus Christ. So there's this picture of Him here in Jude, Jude 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. In other words, you keep yourself in the love of God by, by checking and avoiding and rejecting the lust perpetrated in the congregation as, as an expression of freedom in Christ. And you look for the mercy, the ultimate mercy. You've been shown mercy savingly. The ultimate mercy is the, is the recovery, the redemption, the final, the final going home. This leads to eternal life. Teaching there is a licentious lifestyle, no matter how vocal the person might be about knowing Jesus, is not being led to eternal life. Eternal life is a quality of life. It's, it's the eternal life used as, by Jesus is bigger than heaven. I've come that they might have life, John 10:10, 10, 10, and have it abundantly. It's a quality of life now that prepares us and equips us and provokes in us a longing to have that eternal life quality in heaven. And then Jude 24, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Well, you think, well, that's God, isn't it? Well, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And to present you blameless. There's, that's the role of Jesus. Before the presence of his glory with great joy. It's a powerful picture. Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus ascends and says, I'm sending the comforter. And I will be with you always this promise of the Savior. And so Jude presents him this way, this doctrinality to him who is able. And we should not question whether or not he is willing. His ability in this context and to present you for, means he is not only able, he is willing. He will keep you from stumbling as you abide in him. As you walk in the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit, keep on being filled with the Spirit. It's when we begin to neglect those means, those instructions of how we grow in grace, that we, that we then are subject to stumbling. We're susceptible to stumbling. But he is able to keep us from stumbling if we, uh, if we stay near to him. It'd be the foolishness of a person saying, well, God, uh, we read in the Gospels that, that if Jesus jumped off the temple, the devil said, that he, the, he would give his angels charge who would be sure that he would not, his foot would not even be injured in that. So I'll go jump off the building. Grace is greater? No, that's foolishness. That's, that's testing the Lord. That's foolishness. Well, what about the contribution of Jude to the whole Bible? We believe Jude is the brother of James, as we said earlier. Uh, James and Jude, it's, it's wonderful when you see these fellows who one time claimed that their brother Jesus had a demon, that that's what was driving him, to see them now these bold witnesses after the resurrection. And they write with a, with a stinging style, uh, and they challenge those who would compromise the truth that their brother taught and lived and died and rose again to promulgate. Had a real special uh, tenderness and intensity to it. They both draw upon a nature imagery, both, uh, both 
uh, James and Jude did that. They both call for ethical purity, and they show a pastoral love and concern for the readers, the folks they're writing to. And even the errorists, even those who were living licentious lifestyles and teaching people to go astray, were to be shown mercy, to be rescued. And then I think I said this earlier, but this was a note I found from somebody. It says, though James and Jude were raised in the same household with Jesus, they both humbly referred to themselves as his bond servants. A powerful picture there. They did not claim uh, family kinship as, a, as an advantage or an edge. But it's interesting, as you see the early church develop, clearly their coming to faith in Christ and their zeal for the gospel placed them in positions of leadership uh, in the early church. Some person pointed out, I, I came across this, that, that Jude has this, uh, what he calls an unusual feature of, of the use of triads, of three things. And so just a couple of examples here. In verse 1, uh, Jude, uh, a servant of Jesus Christ, brother of James, called sanctified, preserved. Those three things are called, uh, loved, beloved, and kept is the picture there that Jude uh, likes to describe in, in threes. Verse 2, you saw it earlier, mercy, peace, and love. We don't know why. Uh, I've done some reading on this. I've not found where that was a particularly literary device uh, except to say that when you when you're uh, loading up, that's for emphasis. Paul does this. We've studied this on Wednesday nights. He's done this in teaching on prayer where he kind of ransacks the Greek language, the Greek vocabulary to find these words for prayer and piles them together to, on the emphasis and the importance of that. Uh, in verses 5 to 7, the, the, uh, the people, uh, angels, those who didn't believe, he's, he's describing the people judged by God. Verse 11, uh, Cain and Balaam and Korah. We take these three uh, uh, individuals who were highly regarded uh, and then errorists and came under the judgment of God. So you can, there's, we've, there's a few others, but I think you get the idea that this just shows up. Now, the, part of the controversial aspect of Jude. Not only does he reference Old Testament characters, that's not controversial. Uh, but he references two first, use, first century uh, pseudepigraphal books. Uh, the Assumption of, of Moses is one of them. In uh, Jude 1 9, this is a story here that comes out of a writing called The Assumption of Moses. Uh, regarded with some esteem, with some value, but not, not recognized as of the same quality to be included in the scriptures in the Bible. When the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, said the Lord rebuke you. So this, is a, this comes out of a, a separate document, story of this. And then this quote from uh, the book of Enoch, chapter 1, verses 14 and 15 of Jude, it was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, or the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment. This is out of another book. This is the book of Enoch where this is quoting. On all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they've committed in such an ungodly way. And see how he loads up there? I mean, and, and Jude is drawing upon this, this material. They're ungodly. Their deeds are deeds of ungodliness. And they commit them in an ungodly way. I mean, there's, it's, it's overload to say they have nothing to do with this. And of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So, so he cites these two. Well, what are we to do with that? Well, just remember, this is not unique to Jude in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul would occasionally, we're going to show you these, uh, quote from uh, books outside the Scripture, not to put them on a par with Scripture, but as an illustration. 
And this is what it seems to be what Jude is doing here. He's, he's using these two writings which, which his readers would have been familiar with. It would have been totally nonsensical for him to quote these things if the particular readers he was writing to did not know about them. And he used them as illustrations. Just real quickly, see what Paul did. He cites the Greek poet Aratus in Acts 17, 28, as your own poets have said. He says, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. These were, these were Greek poets. And he, he quotes from this particular one, Aratus, to make his point that we all trace back to one parent. That we all come. He's made all men of one blood. It's his assertion on, on the Areopagus. And then another one was a, was a, a poet named Menander. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. We learn that from the scriptures, but it actually comes from one of the Greek poets named Menander. And then Ep- Epimenides in Titus 1, 12. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy, lazy gluttons. It's interesting when we studied this through the pastoral epistles, he was... Paul does this in a fascinating way. They're familiar with this citation, and he didn't call them that. He's just quoting what, what their own sources say of them. So he just cites it. Now, he cites it, obviously, with approval, but he's not in the position of saying, you fellows are just a bunch of uh, liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. No, as their own people say of them. And so that's, that's how I think you, you uh, handle and contextualize Jude citing two documents that, that are not included in the Scripture. It doesn't mean that he's got a low view of Scripture. It simply means that he found them valuable under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, valuable as uh, illustrations to make his point about the dangers of licentious living in the church. And that's, that's a kind of an uh, overview and a summary of Jude. Any questions or comments or observations you have about what we've looked at here? or something from your own study. Mm-hmm.